Thank you all for being here uh, to celebrate with us the Hispanic and Latinx Heritage Month. I am super excited uh, to hear these wonderful writers read tonight. Uh -huh. And so I'm going to go ahead and start uh, with our first reader. Michelle Moncayo is a poet and artist in New Jersey by way of Ecuador and Dominican Republic. She has received fellowships and residencies from SPACE at Writer Farm, Vermont Studio Center, Canto Mundo, Sundress Academy for the Arts, and Vona. And she has also received a 2020 fellowship from the New Jersey State Council on the Arts. And of course, there's so uh, much more that I could say about her, um, but I do want to give her enough time and spend as much time uh, reading her work. So. Please welcome Michelle. Hi, um, thank you so much, Amanda, for inviting me here. I'm so grateful and happy to be in community with other writers today. And thank you to the Muse Writers Center also for having me. I want to start my reading with a um, poem by Lucille Clifton. This is in Blessing the Boats. And um, the, the poems that I'm going to be reading are about breast cancer. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So I have been working on these poems for a while and I'm going to read them today. Okay, so this poem is called Amazons. When the rookery of women, warriors, all each cupping one hand around her remaining breast, daughters of Dahomey, their names fierce on the planet. When they came to ask, who knows what you might have to sacrifice, poet, Amazon, there is no choice. Then when they each with one nipple lifted back into me, five generations removed, I rose and ran to the telephone to hear cancer, early detection, no, mastectomy, not yet. There was nothing to say. My sister swooped in a circle dance. Audrey was with them and I had already written this poem. Lucille Clifton is the best. So uh, as I mentioned, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, also by the corporations known as Pinktober, uh, the month when a lot of things are manufactured in the color pink and said to be for breast cancer awareness. Um, this is something that's impacted me and my family in a very deep way. Three women in my family were diagnosed with breast cancer and one passed away a few months ago. So a lot of the poetry I've been writing has been about this. And this first poem kind of speaks to the mix of a uh, personal narrative along with a lot of research I've been doing on the commercialization of breast cancer and the exploitation for profits by big companies and how even through this deadly disease, women are still being objectified. So the poem is called, uh, While Ma is in Chemo, the Pinktober Saints Say They Will Save Her. They said the pink would give her more days after the cancer bruised her body blue yellow, pressed pink holy water to her breast, wore pink ribbons on their chests like crosses. They were fighting for the cure, wielding limited edition lipsticks in powerful pink and rebellious rose coated in parabens and phthalates. On sale for the month of October at 20% of the suggested retail price. Her breasts were pressed into a gray blue machine my mother, the glacier, her body collapsing, icy and radioactive. We were afraid to touch her or hold her hand in case the ice cracked and she went under. 
but no one will be able to tell that her body is fighting itself because she's wearing the right lipstick and a blush so powerful it hides the nausea. We didn't have enough money for the wig she wanted, long and wavy, the one that looked like real hair, her curls netting in the bathtub as they fell. But you can buy a limited edition pink rubber duck to float in the water with her hair and breast cancer nail decals, salon quality, $2.50 per purchase. The first night of summer, I shave her head. She just wanted to breathe. She just wanted it off. She sits on the porch to feel the sun on the days she doesn't throw up. Perfect for summer barbecue parties and afternoons on the porch. Drink pink with pink lemonade beer and Zinfandel with pink corks. A cancer delicious. Clink pink. Your cancer cans will bring awareness to breast cancer. There is no dominicanismo about awareness. But if there was, Abuelita would say something like, Awareness is like guests who come to visit once every three months just to say they came by and a door that stays open for them to leave long after October is over. The second poem is um, all made up of slogans from alcohol and beer companies um, Pinktober edition beers. Okay. It's pink beer month for breast cancer. Perfect for beer lovers to support women. This drink is the perfect way to toast for tits cure. Your cancer can will donate 20% of each sale to more cancer cans. Perfect for sunny afternoons and backyard barbecues. You can show your support while never having to step foot in a hospital. Show your support by tweeting at Pink Cancer Can and use the hashtag Beer Lovers for Women. Don't miss your chance to drink pink. Um, so while I was doing research, I found all these ridiculous slogans that were just that were just ridiculous. And um I made a few found poems out of them. So that's one of them. This next poem is not from that, a personal poem. It's called Chemo Dreams. One, it's morning. The smell of smoke in the middle of an ocean. At twilight, I answer my women's endings. At dusk, my women sing for home. Two. I am visited by a dream bird, elastic as memory, the shroud I sleep and wake to, not touched but heard, the eye of the shore. Three, in the mirror of winter, the blue of my shadow speaks through the landscape of memory, glacier of myself, reflected in the hospital tiles. The lilies curl like eyelashes, the earliest memory of the sea floating on my eyelid. Four, on the island, the old piano opens like the flaming mouth of a pomegranate. Music burns in the palm of night, smoke spells my future or lack thereof. Five, when I'm trying to remember what comes back to me, the lilacs behind your ear, the thirst in your singing, the blue in your fingertips, teal and bird-like. Six, when I go, I hope you can close the weeping, the nimbus that grows from my knees, the long lines towards lilacs, 
the nightgown the purple becomes. This poem is a found poem of cosmetic companies and their wonderful promotions for Pinktober pro products. And this is mixed with some um, medical, medical documents about chemo treatments. Feel heavens glide, cancer shades, vessels plumped up, little lymph and the metastasis with bombshell solo liner. This cancer is holographic, that tissue selfie worthy. Creamy cells to cells, sparklers. The packed glitter treatment, cancer, bouncy to the touch, sexy illusion, high gleam cells, the refreshing breast cancer look. Skin vivid, cancer nodes that look glossy and dramatic, exclusive and magnetic, metallic, their tumor sparkling effortlessly. And this last poem is called Lineage. My mother was diagnosed with breast cancer when she was not much older than I am now. Years later, I sit in the treatment room again, white walls next to white sheets, listen to my aunt talk over the beeps, the lighthouses in Rhode Island, the dogwoods in South Carolina. I wanna leave this hospital for at least one more trip this summer. We hope this will be the last woman in our family diagnosed. But if not, it will not be the first time. My mother got mammograms when she was supposed to. The cold metal on her skin opening. The mouth of cancer telling her, I will take you, but not yet. When it came for her, she was misdiagnosed twice. The male doctors told her, you're too young for this to be anything. It took four different treatment centers to be taken seriously. I struggle to explain this to my partner as my mother struggled to explain to the doctors what she knew to be true about her own body. The abnormal cells cluster in our family portraits like pomegranate seeds below the fat of our breasts. In the treatment center, the women say, but how many more treatments? I've been here so many hours already. When can I leave? At night, the doors hang open like ellipses. The moon and her ghost are the only overnight visitors every day. To the public, we are ashes, Greek goddesses who have chipped noses, eyes, faces, breasts. The pedestal is gone. We stand in ruin. They don't see us anymore. I medicate to sleep. I wake up. I pray for the women in my family, the ones in the hospital with my family and for my sisters and I. I give myself a self-exam. The sun is out. Something does not feel the way it should. And who will believe us? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for those poems, Michelle. Oh, man. Thank you so much uh, for that vulnerability as well. <laughs> um, I would like to go ahead and start with our next writer, Dr. Melissa Casaquino is a Puerto Rican writer from the Bronx and an associate professor in the English department at Bronx Community College, CUNY. She serves as the co-faculty advisor for thesis, the literary journal of BCC. Her work has been published in Kalalu, The Fairytale Review, Hippocampus, and Centro. Her book, 
Jesus Colon, 100 Years of a Radical Puerto Rican in New York is under contract and set to be published in 2021. So please welcome Melissa. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's really quite an honor to be here. Those were beautiful, Michelle. Thank you for sharing your work. It was really powerful. Um, so I'm going to start with a poem and um, it's called, My Body is a Calendar in the Dark. I would go as a child from the bright lights of the Bronx into the dark unlit mountain roads of San Sebastián, Puerto Rico. Y en ese oscuro inescapable, find home, find refugio, find love. It was a return to geography built from my matrilineal line of bodies, mountains and mountain women, weathered by storms but unbroken, with names that hung like constellations in my mouth. Edelmira, Gloria, Mercedes, Quintina, Estrella, Nemesia, Lisette, Carmen, Lala, Monza, Carmela, Minerva, Viña, Carmita, Norma, Esperanza, Constancia, Lourdes, Tita, Fela, Juana, La India. Bodies with cyclical bleeding that taught us to begin the counting of days, weeks, months, and seasons, which became years, which became science. Bodies that translated the moon. Night in San Sebastián required new vision. What lights they had would often go. My great-grandmother, Abuela Quintina, would go out into esa oscuridad from her wooden porch, machete in hand. I would hang back, afraid. She would pull me out. No sea hasta cobarde. She was not gentle, but she taught me to look fearlessly into the night sky, into the mountains shrouded in sombras till they became paths I could follow. Pervasive dark became a land of discovering. She would point at murciélagos or the stars y la luna, siempre la luna. Mira la hija, mírala, que bella, es tuya. I follow a truth they hid inside of me like a tiny heirloom seed so that it might survive and someday under the right conditions bloom again with the proper care. Under the dark moon, I look out in the night sky. My body is a calendar in the dark. I bloom, mark time, bleed with pride over the voices of my beloved female lineage saying things like, no diga eso muchacha, que esas cosas no se hablen delante de la gente. Words that had been handed to them like a death sentence, a calendar marking only loss. My body now marks the full calendar of days and nights free, born of the tiny seed with no name they planted in my pockets. So um, this is a short story from a collection I'm working on about Hurricane Maria. It's currently called um, A Storm of Memories, and it's poetry, short stories, and some autobiographical um, essays. This one is called Night Lights, and I'm just going to sort of skip around to um, honor the time, but I'm not sure when I started, Amanda, so if you could just Give me a heads up. Thank you. Fermin boiled an egg on his stove as he watched CNN awaiting the landfall of Hurricane Maria. He peeled the egg and squeezed lemon over it on the small blue and white tea plate that was the last of a set of cups and plates his mother had brought to New York City from Puerto Rico in 1947. He carried the plate and his black coffee in the delicate matching cup to the TV tray in the living room. He was watching the news the way he had watched it during and after 9-11. He could not look away even when it made him sick. During 9-11, Fermin had just been learning how to be retired in 2001 by watching the news all day and deciding what was too dangerous to do, where it was too dangerous to visit, and what was too dangerous to eat. He was always either hungry or bored. When he complained on the phone to his sister Lydia, she just kept telling him to turn off the TV. She did not seem to understand that turning off the TV did not make the dangers go away. The first plane hit while he was making coffee and was on TV by the time he had put the spoon in the cup to stir the sugar. The second one while he was sitting there in his new retirement leather recliner with a donut in his mouth. The first cup of coffee was always accompanied by a donut and the second by a hard boiled egg, a throwback to his days at work when he did it in reverse. 
coffee with the hard boiled egg his wife Julia made for him before leaving, the coffee with the donut he had at work in the workers lounge. It had been one of the perks of working in the copy mill room in a fancy bank on Wall Street. The free donuts and the coffee were part of the deal. Lydia called them the drugs of productivity. Lydia was always complaining about everything good. Sorry. Ah, okay. The first thoughts in disaster are always about proximity. How close am I? Was I? Have I ever been to that disaster? The second thoughts are always selfish. On 9-11, the thoughts had run through his mind quickly. Thank God he didn't work there anymore. Thank God Julia didn't work there anymore. Thank God his son had not taken the job he had tried to get him there, even though that had not saved him either. But still, it ran through his body that those buildings blowing up like that, that was a horrible thing for him to watch knowing his family was in them. He realized quietly as he finished his donut that thousands of people were doing just that at that very moment and they wouldn't know which ones they were, the lucky or unlucky, for so many hours or days to come. Hurricane Maria was different, of course. The horror there so far had been what you could not see and what had not yet happened, but the news could not help from catastrophizing till it felt like it had already happened. He was already stressed as if the hurricane had landed long ago and it was still on the way. It didn't happen until it did. He ate the egg slowly as newscasters all proved that courage and stupidity had dressed up in raincoats to report scenes of absurd winds that were just becoming attractions. The news told him to keep watching and he did. It was not until later that night when they showed a map of the world on satellite and Puerto Rico was no longer there, banished into prehistoric darkness and no one had yet been able to get a call from home that all of it became a new grief, opening old grief, like the waves that might be swallowing his island, though no one could see it on a map till daylight. Now the news told him to keep watching, even though they had nothing to show him other than the absence of home on the screen. Again, he started with the selfish. Thank God mommy and papi were dead, a thought he had never had until that moment of trying to imagine what it would be like to see them disappear into that dark. Thank God Lydia was on vacation with her kids and grandkids in Disney World. They were trapped in a hotel they couldn't afford to stay in more than one week, but they were safe and he could send them money. They had gone in September because it was so much cheaper after kids were back in school. The God of mysterious ways had at least been on duty for that one. His list of dark gratitude stopped at Julia. Julia had left for Puerto Rico five years after their son Junior died. He had not spoken to her in 20 years. She had vanished back into her small mountain hometown like a ghost, never called, never wrote, never answered any of his attempts until he stopped trying. But me had not imagined that that could be possible until it was. They had been in love since they were 16. He thought about her every day, sometimes all day, sometimes only once at night when he would turn out all the lights and there was no parade of tiny night lights along the walls to the bathroom. Julia was terrified of the dark and had made the long hallway to the bathroom like a landing strip. Now it was a kind of dark in Puerto Rico he could not imagine Julia surviving. They kept showing the image of Puerto Rico vanished into thin air in the darkness, swallowed whole on live television. Fermin could imagine the many who held irrational fear and hatred of all things Puerto Rican, including his first boss, enjoying that fantasy. What if we could make them all disappear? That would be great. They would enjoy that thought. Too bad so many of us were sitting right here watching CNN. We wouldn't be that easy to get rid of. Fermin enjoyed that thought until it was interrupted by thoughts of Julia crying in the dark. She would be terrified. It was unbearable to imagine. When he heard the phone ring, he knew it would be Lydia. She would be in a panic about everything, from her house, to her job, to her dog. The call to him, a reminder of the calls they couldn't make to friends and family on the island. He didn't feel like talking. He let the answering machine get it and heard her voice. Fermín, coge el teléfono, por Dios. Puerto Rico se ha desaparecido del mapa, Dios mío. Ay, bendito, ¿qué será de nosotros? Qué desgracia, qué caos. La pobre tata, ¿quién será que la está atendiendo? Dicen que se están muriendo todos los coquis. 
She would go on like that till the answering machine cut her off. She would also call back within the hour and yell at him for not answering the phone. It was better to just answer. He said, hello? Ay, Fermin, yo no sé por qué tú eres así. Answer the phone, pendejo. I did. We're talking, aren't we? I know you never turn off that television. I know you can see it. I'm so scared. He knew she wanted comfort, and in their own ways, they each gave it, but he could not give her what she needed just then. Well, Lydia, for all we know, nothing is happening. The truth is we're watching nothing happen, nothing but darkness. For all we know, everyone is dead, Fermin, por Dios. You know what a hurricane is. Can you imagine the power of one that literally turned off all the lights on the entire island? She cried, and he listened as long as he could. I have to go, Lydia. I'm sending you money to Orlando through Western Union. I know it'll be hard for you to stay there. Let me know if you want to come to New York. I'll send you the tickets. You can stay here as long as you need. I just want to go home, Fermin, pero gracias. I'll call you in the morning. Call me if you hear from anyone. Por supuesto, calmate. We'll talk in the morning. Her message about the rumors that the Coquis had died made him laugh a little. They had no idea what was happening on the island and already people were worried about that damn frog. He hoped they would die, all of them, every last one. He felt like the only Puerto Rican that not only hated the incessant sound of the ridiculous little frog, but more specifically hated how that stupid frog had come to invade everything from the airport gift shops to the Puerto Rican flag. He hated that frog con ánimo. Ojalá que se mueran todito. Even as he thought it, he felt guilty. The damn coqui was so invasive, it felt as if he were wishing the death of every Puerto Rican. <sighs> By wishing death on the frogs. Then there were the ecological disasters all over the world. He'd been watching them in the news. The death of the coqui would surely be a harbinger of the end of days. And so by the time he had turned off the kitchen light and went back to CNN, he had decided that the frogs should live. First, he would commiserate loudly with Lydia as soon as he called her back to say he hoped the coquis were all right. He might even send money to whoever might be trying to save them as soon as the lights came back on. That is, if anything actually happened to them, which he doubted, because honestly, they were a plaga sin fin. Pero he was decided. Que viva el coqui, que viva. At first, Fermin packed his bag with guayaberas and straw hats like he was going on vacation. He packed as if he had tickets and reservations in hand. Then the suitcase mostly filled with night lights and water bottles he had stored in the kitchen seemed destined for more. He added some toilet paper and cans of tuna and took out swimming trunks and pajamas. He packed a set of towels Julia had picked out as guest towels. They were still in the plastic she had left them in. They were old, but well-preserved. When he finished packing, he made a list of things to do in the morning. He wrote, call Lydia, then he crossed it out. She would try to stop him. Send money to Orlando was the only thing related to her left on the list when he was done. He slept on the couch with the suitcase by his side and one nightlight on in the hallway. He slept with his shoes on as if someone might yell fire in the middle of the night. They had talked about Puerto Rico like we were Atlantis, like we had sunk into the sea. He thought this as he laid there still and quiet, calling Julia with his mind. His eyes flittered off to sleep as he sent her images of her nightlights and assured her in his dreams that he would come and that he would never leave her alone in that kind of darkness. <laughs> did I do okay with time? Yes, perfect. <laughs> yes, you did. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that story and for the poem. <laughs> All right. So next, uh, next we have Mike Soto. Uh, Mike Soto is the author of the chapbooks Beyond the Shadows, Inc. and most recently Dallas Spleen. He received his MFA from Sarah Lawrence College and was awarded, awarded the James Merrill Poetry Fellowship by Vermont Studio Center in 2019. His debut poet, a collection of poetry, A Grave is Given a Supper, 
uh, was published by Deep Vellum and is now available uh, for purchase. So yay. <laughs> Thank you, Mike, uh, for being here with us tonight. Thank you. Can, you, can anyone, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. So I'm on the road, so um, might get interrupted, but I'll, I'll, I'll keep a close eye out. Um, so I'm going to read from my book, uh, Grave is Given Supper. Um, just a little bit of background. Uh, I'm just, we're describing it as a narco acid Western told in a series of interlinked poems. There's a couple of characters or protagonists, I like to say, uh, Topito and Consuelo, and it takes place in a fictional border town called El Sumidero. So I'll be reading uh, a few poems uh, exclusively from this manuscript. Um, square inside a circle. Ages ago, this ring was a ring for bulls, built with stone, brought in wheelbarrows. By minds who thought Sumidero would always be a family town, not a city engulfed in violence. 3,766 murders this year, not counting the unfound, missing, or disappeared. Today, a much younger crowd comes to watch the men who bang rolls of money out of their shirt pockets, place bets on the ground. Sometimes while getting the spur blade tied to the back of its leg, a gallo will mistake dust for dawn and let out, and let out a crow in the, middle of a, in the middle of the commotion. People scream, ya ven, orale cabrones, aflojen el dinero. Golden arms, boots of exotic leather, several which point like prows of ships. When they square off, the roosters like two sparks trying to get out of the same box. <clears throat> the wall commonly known as the brow of God. In Sumidero, the wall is always looming. Night and day are North Star, blunt reminder of the difference between this life and the one in El Norte. By far the reason why the ground is gutted with tunnels, decades of desperate maneuvers, so many names trapped and trying. If not a tunnel that connects the pink corner, stair, a pink corner store basement to the bathroom of a Texaco where a razor and a change of clothes wait, then a tunnel that connects a restaurant table always reserved to an empty pool of a house in Calexico. If not the tunnel that takes you to a Malverde shrine in Agua Prieta said to be teeming with luck, then a tunnel that runs through a copper mine to a greenhouse in Las Cruces. The above ground alternatives, snake yourself into an engine block of a truck, agree to have your body stacked under cargo. While the heat rises exponentially in a trailer inching towards the border, with the sea of other vehicles all in the same limbo, covering desert, valley and mountain. The wall is an endless mind of steel bars east of Nogales, creased slabs in the worst parts of Sumidero, where many use the barrier as the fourth wall of their homes. Some sections of the wall are rigged with ground sensors and tracked by drones, and some are an open invitation to walk a cemetery of scorched sand. But the section stitched into the minds of everyone that lives here is the section of the wall most have never seen. Miles away where they say the wall goes into the ocean and the constant fog serves to hide that it ends or to maintain the awe of it going all the way across. The useful rituals before in sleep, we put our hands together and called a distant warmth to come halo our feet when the sheets have been thrown from our bodies. Summon that, say, that sensation to rise from our toes to hover above our heads like a hummingbird. When, when, 
When we wake up, our hair is perfectly combed and parted, steaming as if our dreams had us working in the cold. And because we've slept the entire day in order to be awake the entire night, we enter the cemetery with the sun gone down, gather our first thoughts with a cup of black as the first, as the first wreaths arrive. Two men each carry a golden weight of, flower, of flowers caked so densely to the door-like frames. And since there's always some pendejo trying to do it all by himself, we lend our shoulders and learn two versions of the cross sit on top of each other because the useful rituals survive. Learn moths flicker above the graves because the men decorating the entrance have decided for the third time the arch needs more. When it's night enough, the ether that dances above the flames can be seen. Some may never notice, or it might come to them all at once when enough families trickle in, start dressing the tombs of loved ones, the labyrinth everyone must walk to avoid stepping on the graves of others. A mother hands a spade to her daughter, strains a picture of her husband after kissing it several times. There's a feeling to take away when the cemetery is lit up like this, hands shaking like cities in our pockets because it's gotten cold. Remember completely enough, notice the seeds already held in your fists, the ones that will lift our lives above the ground just the inch we need. Consuelo in the poppy fields. Sparked on the steep terrain of a town just west of Sumidero, fields of poppies where lentils once thrived. Some still remember the black smoke, how quickly after the men with torches in their hands and bandanas over their noses left, the ultraviolet flowers blanketed the hillsides. The most lucrative drug market the world has ever known raged into existence just north of the border. The cartels responded to the soaring demand with exponential growth. One field became seven. Experienced workers became supervisors, putting the word out posting flyers for people built low to the ground. Teenagers poised enough to come on as security transform the fortunes of their families instantly after generations of humble earnings. The vow never to return to a life of having nothing, always a live wire. During collecting season, a full moon on a clear night might bathe the fields in the pool of a light that makes the scored pods come. Consuelo grew up here, claims on such occasions, hummingbirds of a nocturnal breed arrive and become ecstatic, sucking on the pods left oozing, slow down from their hyper-awareness to perch on the rocks in their delirium, the iridescence of their feathers a green rarely seen. Okay, and this will be the last poem. Um, thanks again for having me. Um, it's called A Few Visions, Lopito's List. Sometimes there's a table at the heart of a labyrinth, with a cross made from kernels of maize beneath it, and a supper I must get to before it gets cold. Other times the heart holds a chair caught in a dream fire, and the labyrinth is lit up like a circuit. A path so obvious, it tames me to a core of forward motion. To sit down willingly, learn to breathe. Through the rising flames, see the ship under the stars, like a mountain waiting to be unmoored. To grasp the poise of dragonflies, hummingbirds, deer, all creatures whose complete stillness is ecstatic. To know the day after death I'll walk through an empty doorway, find myself in a field of moonlit grass. I'll roam a black and white world where intuition sees more than sight, and sight is not susceptible to all the pretty lies. The day after death, I'll find Consuelo 
the tips of her toes, trying to glimpse into the flickering window. Even now, I'm dying to cradle her foot in my hand and buy her a look. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. <laughs> oh, thanks so much. Uh, I'm glad you're able to read uh, and join us tonight. <laughs> sure, for sure. Uh, and so next we have Irena Laura Silva. Uh, she is the author of a three poetry collections, uh, Furia, Blood Sugar Canto, Kukakai, House of Song, an e-chapbook, Enduring Azucares, as well as a short story collection, uh, Flesh to Bone, uh, which won the Primero Atlan. Uh, Irene is currently working on her first novel, Nasi, and her second collection of short stories, The Light of Your Body. So please welcome Irene. I'm so glad you're able to join us tonight. First of all, my huge apologies for being late. I had like this crazy crisis day. I left work 45 minutes late. All the craziness happened. No but way. I'm here. I'm here. And at least I got to hear Melissa and Mike. Uh, beautiful work. Um, and thank you, Amanda, for the invitation. So I wanted to read from um, the short stories that I'm working on right now. So this is the from the, the title story, The Light of Your Body. And I'm going to read as much of it as I can. And in how many minutes? 12 minutes? Uh, you have 15. Okay, so 12 to 15 minutes until I find a good stopping place. And then if you want to know what happens afterward, you're going to have to go find the next issue of uh, Raspa magazine, which is the Queer Latinx magazine edited by Cesar Ramos. It should be coming out any day now. And uh, there's no announcement yet. So if y'all want to bug him and ask him, you know, where is the issue? You know, demand is good. So <laughs> here we go. The light of your body. My hands won't stop shaking. It was too quiet when I came home, too quiet. And the quiet told me what had happened even before I saw you. There was too large a silence in my heart and I couldn't breathe. I fell to my knees. If it hurt, I didn't feel it. I just wanted to hold you. You were so still, already cold, your eyes wide open. I wanted to kiss you, but didn't want to feel your skin cold under my lips. What if it made me forget all the kisses that had gone before, the warm ones and the sweet ones and the urgent ones? What if you no longer smelled like you? What if all that was left was the scent of your shampoo and your lotion, but not that scent that made you you? I remembered your kiss from this morning, its edge of melancholy, how it lingered with me as I rushed out the door. Breathing hurts. The air is too heavy for my lungs. I close your eyes and press you tight to me and time passes. I don't know how much time. I try to breathe and then I'm sobbing and sobbing and can't breathe for all the tears. You're gone. You're gone and I'm alone and not alone because you are still with me and I can still hold you. You are safe here in my arms. I won't let you go. I'm sorry I wasn't here. You needed me and I wasn't here. I wanted to always take care of you, wanted to be your refuge and your home, wanted my love to flood away all your pasts, wanted to hold you until you never felt the need to flinch. Your hair is as soft as it ever was. I smooth it away from your face, kiss your eyelids. Nothing will ever hurt you again, Amapola Mia. No more pain. No one can ever hurt you again. No one will ever touch you again. I will make it so that my hands are the last hands to touch you. I wipe away my tears. I need to carry you to the bedroom. I slide one arm under your back, another under your knees, but can't lift you that way. I prop you up so that you are sitting up, leaning against the couch. Then I place my feet on either side of your hips, lock my hands behind your waist, and pull up until you are on the couch. From here, I can pull you over one shoulder. I wish I could carry you any other way. You're not heavy, but you're taller than I am. I don't want your fingertips to drag along the floor, but I'm afraid that's what they're doing. I carry you to the bedroom and lay you down, slide the pillow beneath your head, and cover you with a white lace coverlet you love. I stay there for a while, tracing the lines of your face, touching your skin, still impossibly soft and bright, both gold and cinnamon. Time passes. You're gone, but I still turn off the ceiling fan so you won't get cold. I pull away the lace coverlet, fold it, 
You only have a robe on over a thin t-shirt and panties. I remove them as gently as possible and remember all the times I put you to bed after a little too much drinking. Sometimes you'd wake up giggling and pull me towards you. Sometimes you'd stir in your sleep and start screaming, start slapping and kicking me away. I wait to see what you will do, but nothing. No invitation, no fight, only stillness. I brush your long hair first, brush it until it shines, until it radiates in every direction from your face. Dark waves. I've always loved your hair. It was what caught my attention first, the way it swayed against your back as you walked. How soft it was every time I dug my hands, my face into it. How you'd lean forward sometimes so that your hair screened your face. How I loved it when you'd drag your hair over my body, its whispering softness on my breasts, on my thighs, on my back. When I first met you, I used to fantasize about wrapping it around my wrist, about pulling on it until your chin jerked up, keeping you that way. But I taught myself to not want it. Brushing your hair, I am not tempted. Just the thought fills me with a soft horror. I drag the large folding table out of the closet and set it up by the bed, go to the second bedroom and collect my silk thread, my thinnest needles, my scissors, my soft blue pencils. From the linen closet in our bathroom, I bring out the little washcloths and the French lavender soaps you loved best, your brush, your favorite towel, the one with the tree and its hundred differently colored leaves. I fill a basin with warm water. I lather the long lines of you, your arms, your wrists, your hands, your small breasts, your long abdomen, your hips, your thighs, your long, long legs. It seems so long ago, that first morning we lay naked, facing each other, silent, eyes wide, reaching out to softly touch, withdraw, touch again, so gently learning each other, somehow making us more each other's more thoroughly than we had the night before. The silence ended when I touched your back and you giggled uncontrollably. You're always ticklish shoulder blades. Impossible now that you aren't flinching and pushing me away. Impossible that you're so silent. I turn you around and lather your back. Soap you, rinse you, dry you. Change the sheets beneath you. I say no goodbyes to your body. I will never say goodbye. I kiss your eyelids and cover you again. It takes me two hours to gather everything. I pull out a small basket and shears from the hallway closet with your gardening supplies. I go out to the backyard and start clipping. I want to bring them all in. Every rose, petunia, gardenia, sunflower, hibiscus, dianthus blossom. Every bougainvillea, jasmine, esperanza, hollyhock. There's no way to know how many I'll need. And you'd love them all. I choose only the most beautiful blossoms. Without scars, just open, the most fragrant. Only the most beautiful of each kind of flower. As I clip them, their aroma, sweet and sharp and subtle, commingle with the scent of their green, green limbs bleeding. I see you in every flower, remembering you on hands and knees, planting each one in the earth. When you were planting these polys, these poppies, I wiped dirt from your cheek before bedding down to kiss it, to taste the salt of your sweat on your neck. You laughed and grabbed my shoulders and pinned me to the ground under you. I'm not one of your plants, I cried. Yes, you are, you said, tossing handfuls of loose earth on my chest. I'm going to plant you here and water you until you blossom. I grabbed your hands. I don't think I'd make very pretty flowers. You are the beautiful one. You stopped, leaned in close, and brushed the dirt off my face. You're my earth. Without you, there'd be no flowers. Mi tierra, that's what I'm going to call you forever. And you kissed me, and I breathed, amapola mia, against your golden skin. I see it as I'm choosing the brightest of the sunflowers, an hour away from dusk, still plenty of light. It's at the far end of the yard between the shed and the fence, head lowered, hackles raised, coyoto. That's what you'd always called it. Even motionless, it somehow looks broken, not black, but the color of mottled blood stained with fresh crimson. I could see the white bones of its legs exposed in places through the matted fur. I'd never known what to say when you'd tell me it was there that it had come and gone many times in your life, that when it was there, you could see it out of the corner of your eye. When it was there, its howling kept you from sleeping at night, that you heard it even when you weren't at home, even when you thought you were okay, even when you were happy and in my arms. It growls at me. I look at it head on. Its eyes are two bottomless holes that swallow all the light. I won't let it have you. It won't take you. 
I meet the absence of its eyes with all the anger and grief tossing inside me. It stays in its corner while I back away and enter the house through the patio door. I don't take my eyes off it as I close and lock the wrought iron door and slide the patio door closed. For the tiniest fraction of a moment, I lower my eyes and assure myself that the basket full of flowers is undamaged. That's all it takes. The coyote is a dark blur in the yard and then its body is crashing against the iron bars. Again and again, all teeth and ravaged flesh. I hurry, the front door is locked tight. The door in the kitchen leading to the garage is the filmiest door we have. I lock it, bolt it, push the heavy wooden dining table against it. I run from room to room, locking doors and windows, drawing all the curtains. I don't want it looking in. I can still hear it. It's throwing itself against the door, sounds of wet flesh. I wonder if it will tear itself apart. I rush back to you, lay the basket on the table and take you into my arms. I put the goyoto out of my mind. I only want to think of you as I do this, murmuring low, so low against your skin. And even when I am quiet, every time I breathe, every time I exhale, you will know I am calling to you, mi flor, mi cielo, mi reina, mi vidita. I examine each petal, laying them softly against each other, spread in a magnificent spill of colors across your skin, across your limbs. I hold them to you, wanting to find the colors, the petals that best follow each other. I will layer them so that my tiny stitches will be invisible. When I was making your wedding dress, I breathed, I will love you forever into every single pierce and pull of the needle. I remember your voice. Like fish scales, you cried out, laughing and staring in fascination. Do you trust me to do this, love? I asked when I was sewing together the 300 diamond-shaped panels that formed the skirt of your wedding dress. Always, even if you make me look like a fluffy mermaid, you murmured against my neck and kissed me. I love you now more than I did then. This time, I will breathe love into each push to the needle and draw out your pain with each pull all the pain I wasn't strong enough to hold for you. I unspool the silk, thread the needle. Your skin is silk, my sides are silk. Silk my breath, silk my eyes, silk my hands. Purple petunia petals and white and pink rose petals on the soles of your feet, on your toes, around your ankles. How easily the needle moves in and out of your skin. Looping whispers, sunflower petals, red and peach and yellow hibiscus, golden marigolds on your calves and knees and thighs. I line up each petal, six stitches on the upper half of each side, enough to secure each petal, touching each one as little as possible with my hot hands. You always said my hands were like small suns, radiating heat. I could never believe how cold you always were to the touch. I always held your hands to keep them warm, tucking them against my throat or blowing my warm breath on your fingertips. You begged me often to rub your back and your feet. You're cold now, but my touch does nothing to warm you. You lay there still and quiet. You used to slip your hands into my pockets and joke about putting a bun in my oven and then giggle at my grimace. You don't sigh as my hot hands move from your feet to your calves, to your thighs, your cold flesh, doesn't respond to the hot tears falling on your skin. Mil gracias. So yes, go check out Raspa Magazine to find out how that ends. Because there ends up being all kinds of things about Sholo Squinkly's and the underworld and healing the spirit and everything else. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> It took me a while. I was like, oh, is she done? I was like, wait. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, I'm so glad that you were able to be here tonight. It was wonderful to hear poetry, prose, everything um, just from all of us. So thank you again so much. <laughs>